Senso and D'Angelo came, with, with, came through with this critical social justice literacy, and I quote them, we must be able to see how our ideas, views, and opinions are not objective and independent, but rather the result of a myriad of social messages and conditioning forces, in that everywhere we go, the context of our identities changes. I always try to get my students to understand when I'm at a, a professor at Colgate University, I have a simple uh, identity there. I want to be viewed as a professor. And when I go home, I want to be viewed as a husband, a father, a son. So our identities begin to shift within these, in, in these forces, but people are all constantly bumping up against us and telling us how we should be identifying who we are. And so I, I began to look at all of these identity theories, the stage models of from the pre-encounter to the encounter to becoming these self-actualized people. But one of the main theories that stood out to me was James Paul G. And it was this idea of the ascribed discursive identity versus the achieved identity. And we heard this morning when um, our main speaker was talking about how he was misidentified as not being a lawyer. This is the way in which people try to ascribe these identities upon us, and we are aching with this need to be recognized of our achieved identities. And these battlegrounds happen all the time because most of the time we feel marginalized. We are told where we belong and told where to sit and told how to act. And the empowerment comes from more and more recognition of these identities. So today I'm talking more in the lines of this autoethnography. I think we all need to write our autoethnographies. That then we can begin to see our place within the social justice work. The place in which we want to be the type of educators that we want to be. So basically I get my start with the White Privilege Conference in 1999 and I've been presenting there basically every year up until now. WPC 17 is in Kansas City, Missouri this year. I mentor a lot of Korean adoptees, as you'll see from some of the work that I talk about. I've read anthologies, I've, I've, I've looked at narration and autoethnography, and one of the, the autobiographies or the autoethnographies that stood out to me was President Barack H. Obama's Dreams from My Father, where he talks about this dual identity, this, this push in the shove, and why he referred to himself as Verity for most of his life, and then changed to Barack. Um, but along those lines, I keep coming back to this engagement, this engaging within the social justice arena, engaging within the literature, engaging with other people to get our fill within that so that we can begin to see ourselves in this empowered aspect. And then we begin to enact the change. But most often we want to just jump to enactment. We don't want to engage in the material, we just want to see what the media has told us how to believe and how to act and how to think, and we jump straight to enactment without realizing that we have to empower these identities in order to have that sustained enactment. Eddie S. Blog Jr. Uh, wrote Democracy in Education, and uh, this just I, I'm just reading it uh, currently, but this quote stood out to me. Racial justice gets reduced to a charitable enterprise a practice by which white people do good for black people. That is, that is not equality. Whoops, I apologize for that. That is not equality. Confronting this fact would take us a long way toward achieving racial justice in this country. It's not about doing good. It's about engaging in the ideas, engaging ourselves within this so that we can feel this sense of empowerment. And so today I'm going to talk to you about my autoethnography. And again, it's mine. It's mine to use and a platform for all of you to begin to see how this begins to work, not only within ourselves, but with our students as well. And part of this comes from this idea to the road to empowerment, of thinking about the lullabies, thinking about the ways in which society wants us to put our identities to sleep. And then we have this grand awakening and many people in the identity world call this the crisis. And I don't want us to think about this as a crisis, this awakening of coming to terms, of coming to realizations of this is not who I am. 
or who I believe I am. The awakening is scary, and some of us want to go right back to sleep. Some of us aren't ready for this awakening, and we just want to, we just want to hide under the covers, but it leads to further explorations. It may take small steps at the beginning, but these explorations leads us to more reflections, and more reflections leads us to more explorations, and more explorations leads us to more reflections, and we begin to have this sense of empowerment of who I am and what kind of social activist or advocate I want to be. So today I go through the lullabies in my narrative to who I am today. I hope that you won't judge me. I hope that you can learn from this, uh, this journey towards empowerment. I hope that you can see even your lives embedded within this. So the lullabies is, uh, I want to be like white. In February of 1971, I arrived in America. And like so many adoptees before me, the airport is our birthplace. This is the first time we get to have photos with the family. There's no photos of us with white gowns and in hospital beds. This is the first time that we begin to interact with our new identities. And this is my family in 1976, my mother and father in the center. They have two biological children, Catherine and Ted, the only time I will use that term, biological children. They adopted my older sister from Korea, uh, to the, your far right, then myself from Korea, and then Robert and James from Vietnam. My youngest brother James is still famous to this day as he's one of the last children to be baby airlifted out of Saigon. In 1977, my parents again adopted more children. They adopted my older, sister, older brother and sister, Michael and Jenny, Jennifer, to make ourselves a new family. And then in 1982, they adopted my younger sister, Susanna. Part of what I asked them at one time, why did you adopt so many children? Why, what, 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 was this, what was going on in your mind? And my mother and father replied quite adamantly, it was, it was our duty. It was our duty as Americans, it was our duty that we left behind so many children in, in the wake of war, in the wake of, in the wake of uh, military uh, occupation, so to say. They felt it was somewhat of their social justice duty. But they weren't prepared for us. They weren't prepared to grow, raise a family, a multiracial, a multiethnic, a multicultural family in the great state of Iowa. Because when I went to school, I thought I was an American. I spoke only English. I knew nothing of the land that I left behind. I saw myself as this American kid. And kids would come up to me and say, Chinese, Japanese, dirty knees, or me, Chinese, me, play joke, me go pee pee in your coke. And I often went home with tears in my eyes, and I said, Mommy, Daddy, why are they doing this to me? And my mommy and daddy would reply, Sticks and stones may break your bones, but words can never hurt you. You have to be stronger than them. You have to be more powerful than them. But I didn't feel stronger than them. I began to see my differences, and I told them, my friends, I sold them. I told them time and again, time again, no, 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 no. I am white, just like you. Look at these adoption papers. Look at them very closely. And I remember taking them to school with me and showing my friends, look, 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 look. I'm white just like you because under that race there's a W with a question mark that said I am white just like you. But we, we later learned that they put the white and the question mark in race to make us more appealing to white parents in America. That maybe, possibly, they were biracial children that they could be adopted in this way. But the resistance was there, you know, part of me was growing up as this all-American boy. I wanted to excel in sports, I wanted to do well in school, I wanted to do well by who I am. And it kept coming back to, I want to see, I wanted people to see me as me. I wanted them to see me as the American kid, as the all-American boy. But they never saw me as such. And the question, when it comes back to the research, is why? What made me want to be like white? What made me look in the mirror and say, I hate this person looking back at you? What made me 
want to surrender this racial, ethnic identity that looked back at me. Well, it goes back to the historical foundations of America that we were hearing about a little bit this morning. It wasn't good to be Asian in America. You could be lynched just as well in California. And if you look at that cartoon a little bit closer, you can see who's doing the lynching. It's the pitting the oppressed against the oppressed. It was Irish immigrants pitted against Chinese immigrants so that who can make $1.25 a day and who was going to make $2 a day. And then we also see this again as who is the American? And the famous uh, flower shop, grocery shop picture there, I am an American. And keep trying to tell people I am an American. But oftentimes, still to this day, where are you from is the first question they will ask me. We've tried to embed ourselves within this American fabric, this fabric that Ronald Takaki talks about in a different mirror. But oftentimes we are pushed out of the melting pot, pushed to the side, and said, you don't really belong here. And so what are other parts of this history that we have to begin to look at? We look at the evil conquerors, the, the, the yellow peril, the takeover, these exotic women who will fulfill white men's desires at every turn. Um, and we begin to see this theme throughout the media. As Asians, um, as we invade with war, Asian women have to sell their bodies to survive. And we begin to see also in these early days of the media where they were afraid to even have Asian actors. They had to put tape on their eyes and put, uh, put the buck teeth as in Mickey Rooney and Breakfast at Tiffany's and speak in this strange foreign accent. And even Marlon Brando gets to play a Japanese servant. But by 1965, the Civil Rights Movement comes along, and part of the Civil Rights Movement that most people fail to recognize was the revision of our Immigration Act. Before we were excluded, no wonder our populations were so small, less than 1% at this time of America. <clears throat> but when we lifted this act in 1965, you have to think about this. Who were the first Asians and Asian Americans uh, to, to begin to populate America? They came to America with a fistful of dollars and a backpack full of education. They were ready to succeed in America. But we deemed them the model minority. We put this identity upon them and said, you are the model minority. We are going to pit you against the black, black population. We are going to tell that black population over there, you must act like the model minority. Not the model citizen, not the model American, but the model minority. Putting us on this pedestal to say, see, this is how model minority, this is how the minority population should act. They should not claim racism. They should just overcome it. They should not claim discrimination. They should just overcome it. Part of the model minority stereotype is silencing that social justice identity. So basically, when White Privilege Conference first starts to begin, there's hardly any Asians or Asian Americans presenting at the conference. Because we were told we were not supposed to be fighting against these things. We're supposed to be subservient. We're supposed to abide by the laws. We're supposed to have this good education. And we're supposed to be anti-affirmative action, pitting the oppressed against the oppressed. But as we move into the 1970s, we get to see a different picture of Asian Americans. We get to see Sulu, right? Uh, we get to see um, Kung Fu fighting, a black man singing a song about Kung Fu fighting. I, I mean, that's quite amazing to me. The, the ways in which acceptance was somewhat there. And, we had Bruce Lee. <laughs> I mean, come on. Bruce Lee was, was bad, right? I mean, he was, he, was, he was making waves on the silver screen, but the media wasn't ready for Bruce Lee, right? They, they took him off of uh, uh, Kung Fu, and they, they chose a white guy instead, and they made him cover his eyes in, as Cato in, uh, in the Green Corner. And then Jackie Chan did come to America in 1981, only told, we're not ready for you in the early 1980s. And this is when I'm growing up. This is the time when I've become a teenager, so to say, and, and being told time and time again, you don't belong, 
you're not one of us. And they didn't actually say it that way, right? They didn't actually say these things to me that way. They, they would say and they would look at those foreign Asians over there and say, you're not like one of them. I had somewhat of an acceptance there, but I knew I'm not white. So what am I? Because basically coming of age in the 1980s was very difficult. We had all these wonderful white stars doing wonderful and crazy things. I wanted to dance like Tom Cruise in my underwear and sing a song. I wanted to be the valley guy like Nicolas Cage in Valley Girl. I wanted to be Ferris Bueller's Day Off. But I could never be any of those because this is the image that Hollywood chose for me. This was the identity that Hollywood chose for me. I am not Long Duck Dong, but all through high school, my nickname was The Donger. And The Donger was everything that I wasn't, everything that I didn't want to be. And I wanted to gain recognition as an American. I always thought in my head, you know, I'm better than these people. I'm smarter than these people. Why do they put me this way? Why do they make me feel as though I'm forever foreigner, forever distant, forever not one of them, the forever fresh off the boat image haunted me wherever I go. Every kid, <laughs> it seemed like in small town Iowa, would come up and ask me if I knew Kung Fu. And I would tell them, no, I don't. And I actually wanted to resist even eating Chinese food. I never wanted to be seen anywhere near other Asian people because I didn't want to be associated with those people over there. Especially as it came to the aspect of the model minority. I didn't want to be good in school. I wanted to resist this idea that Ronald Reagan and George H. Bush put upon me. I wanted to resist this identity that said, you must go to Harvard. You must go to Yale. You must be Asian. Because there's something also happening in the 1980s that most of us weren't aware of. It wasn't good to be Asian, even though you were considered the model minority. You can think of Vincent Chin being beaten to death by baseball bats and his, his, uh, his uh, killers going free. We can think of all the ways in which Detroit changes overnight because of the, the Japanese automobile industry. And we can begin to think about how this means the yellow peril is still upon us, the forever foreigner. And the same thing continues for women. I still remember watching uh, Stanley Kubrick's uh, uh, Full Metal Jacket and seeing Papillon Susu say, Hey, you got girlfriend in Vietnam? Me so horny, me love me long time. That phrase is still used to this day. We heard a pop song, or I guess a hip hop song, along these lines. I couldn't believe it. We see this thing, this, this recognition, this, this ascribed identity happening, not only to Asian Americans, you can start replacing anybody within this and seeing how ascribed identities become damaging and more and more damaging. The disempowerment of our identities around the ascribed identity. Because we weren't told that we could be martial arts experts, at least on the silver screen. Ralph Macchio gets to be the karate kid, right? You still remember Ralph Macchio, probably, as the Karate Kid. So coming out of this time, I'm not, I'm Asian American. So finally, I come to myself and I say, I'm Asian American. But I have no idea what that means. I leave, I leave my high school behind, never, <laughs> never to return. Thinking to myself, okay, I finally have broken free from this racism. My parents are still telling me you have to be better than all of them. But by this time, folks, and again, I don't want to throw my parents under the bus here. By this time, I don't believe anything they have to say about race and racism in America. Because those sticks and stones, I'm 46 years old, they still hurt. And I've told them that plenty of times. I ran away trying to find a new identity, finding an, an, an identity that meant something to me. So I started going to these Korean culture camps and becoming a uh, counselor within this, trying to be a role model for the next generation of Korean adoptees. 
that we're even questioning why are so many Korean adoptees still coming to America. But my college years are, are quite fascinating because I'm trying to bridge this divide between Asian and American. But I'm still like to get high with white girls, right? Because that's what I know. That's what I feel. So when I see there's all these things happening before me, I keep saying, where do I belong? Where do I fit in? And so the first identity awakening comes through loud and clear. I have to go to Korea. If I just go to Korea, folks, if I just go there one time, all this identity angst will be cleared up. And I went to Korea with backpack in hand. I got off the plane and I just looked around and now I know what white people feel like in Iowa. Everybody looked like me. I didn't stand out. I, didn't, I, I, I could fit right in. Until I opened my mouth. I didn't speak any Korean. Haseo, hello. Kamsamnida. Thank you. And I still like to tell this story. I'm sitting at a little kimbap stand on the street where they sell these uh, rolled sushi. Um, and, I, you know, again, I point to the menu, I get the, I get the kimbap that I want, and this, uh, the, the shopkeeper, an older woman, comes up to me, and she's smiling, and she's handing me the food, and she bends down, and she says, You Chinese? You Japanese? And I begin to cry. Because always in America, people would always come up to me, Hey, are you Chinese? Hey, you, you Japanese? I'd say, I'd say, no, no, man. No, man, I'm Korean. I'm Korean. But as I looked up at this older woman, I started to cry. And I said, no. I'm an American. That's who I am. I'm an American. And I wanted so desperately to go home and, and feel this American identity again. To see that I belonged in this country that I called my home for 21 years. And so the immersed explorations begin. I'm Asian American, but what does that mean? So I'm sitting in the classroom. I'm a, I'm a fourth, fifth, and sixth grade teacher, elementary school teacher. I've graduated from college. I'm ready to get married. I'm ready to start my life. But there's something holding on to me. That woman who sold me the kimbap is still telling me, you went all the way to Korea, and you're still not Korean. You went home. The adoption agencies also call it the, the motherland tour. I went to my motherland and I was still rejected. I was still told, you don't belong. And that ached at me. That ached me so much that, you know, as I stood in front of my students, I kept thinking, I don't know who I am. I don't know who this person is. I still remember thinking how ugly I am. How worthless I am. Because I don't know what I'm doing. And so I, the next answer came to me. The next awakening came, and it came with a powerful surge. You have to move to Korea. And that's what I did. No longer had a fiancé, got rid of that. <laughs> Quit my job, packed my bags, and went to Korea. And I tried so desperately to become Korean, to study the language. I studied Korean. I studied Korean history. I think I know more about Sigmund Rhee than most Koreans do now. Because I wanted to live a life of a Korean. And these friends to, to your left, they were my office mates and they were the most wonderful people in the world. Around coffee every morning before the boss showed up in this research center. They would just let me talk in Korean with all the mistakes that I could make. And they would listen intently. And they would laugh with me. And one day, the, the, the secretary in the middle, the phone's ringing, and she's just looking at me going, you answer it. She gave me the confidence that I could speak in Korean. She gave me that empowered identity that I've been searching for for so long. And it felt so good, folks. It felt so good to engage, to immerse in this aspect. I couldn't change my face. I couldn't change my eyes. I couldn't change my hair. But I thought I could change my culture, right? I thought I could become Korean. And I was introduced to Professor Young at Lu, and Mrs. Lu, who I endearingly called her Samanim. 
And they would often say that they're my Korean parents now. And I often, always when they said it, I didn't like it. I didn't like that they thought that they could now be my parents. But I loved the love that they gave to me, that they tried to endure in me. And Mrs. Liu would always say when it was my birthday or any special holiday in Korea, she would give me money, which was typical of parents giving to their children. And she would always say to me, I, I'm not giving you as much as my oldest son, but I'm definitely giving you more than my youngest son. <laughs> and it felt good. It felt really good until the critical reflections began to set in. I'm never going to be Korean. I had spent my entire life in America. My, my DNA, so to say, got changed very quickly once I was adopted. And so when my Korean family meets my family, things begin to spin in my head. In actuality, folks, this is what I'm not so proud of, I want to leave all of America behind. I want to love, I want to leave the people who love me the most, who love me the most. My parents who raised me with all the love that they could give, misinformed or in, uninformed, ignorant or educated, they loved me. They loved me for who I was and who I am. But when they came to visit me in Korea, Koreans would ask me, who are these white people? And I never said that they were my family. Mm -hmm. I said, they're just visitors from the U.S. And that hurt. That hurt just as much. Because in many ways, when we come back to the subscribe versus these achieved identities, I didn't want people to continue to ascribe me as different. I wanted to be one of them. And so the third thing came along. I'd been living in Korea for three years. I had separated myself from my family in America. Less frequent phone calls. There was no email at this time, folks. So no letters were going home. And I thought to myself, I can completely, I can completely cut this off. I can completely cut the cord, so to say, if I really so chose. And maybe then, folks, maybe then I will actually become a Korean. And the cord that was cut, that I was ready to cut, is if I could only find my birth parents. If I could, if I could locate them, if I could engage with them, then all of this would be gone, was my belief. Some of you in the room are going, ignorance. <laughs> but it was, it was what I began to think. It was part of my identity journey. And I still remember this day. I mean, this is an, this is an advertisement in one of the newspapers in, in, in Korea. I went on, on the news a couple of times. And I actually went to my orphanage. And I think the orphanage began uh, a whole kind of changing point for me. Uh, it's still hard to, to, to talk about the visit to the orphanage. But I still remember holding E Dong a little boy about the age of, uh, that I was at the time when I was in that orphanage. And I prayed to God. I prayed so hard for him. And I told him on that day that I will make life better for him. That I will send this message back to America. I will send this message back to these adoptive parents. I will send this message back so that he can have a better life. So my master's degree is now complete at Yonsei University and I'm at this crossroads. I know that I can't cut that cord. I can't separate myself. But I'm never going to be Korean. You know, the only jobs basically available to me in Korea at that time was being an English teacher. And I just could not see myself teaching English for the rest of my life. And so I returned to America and I'm never going to be Korean but I'm not white either so where what, what am I and where do I belong became the next awakening. And it was rediscovering America. They talk about diplomats coming back to the United States after being abroad for many years. And they have an adjustment period. But for me, it was something different. And for me, it was a, this aching, this, this desire that I, I did not fulfill this identity journey in America. And I still remember this song going through my head with Simon and Garfunkel's America. 
Kathy, I'm lost, I said, though I knew she was sleeping. I'm empty and aching, and I don't know why. My identity was completely disempowered at this time. I didn't know where to go. I kept telling my family, I kept telling Eddie Moore Jr., I'm going to Brazil. At least there I, I know I don't belong. Because in America, it was so obvious that I didn't belong. I still remember at the University of Iowa, I went to, uh, to, to register as a teacher's assistant, and the person asked me for a visa. And I, <laughs> I'm ignorant. I said, all I have is a MasterCard. <laughs> and she didn't think that was very funny, and I didn't know she, what she was actually asking for. But coming back to America at this time, I began to look closer at the media, and the fob just will not go away. Getty Wananabe, you know, I have always said, if I ever met Getty Wananabe, long duck dong on the street, I'm taking this guy out. <laughs> I mean, he caused me so much hell when I was growing up. I was going to kill this guy. And I heard this great interview on NPR. Getty Wananabe is from Idaho. Not Iowa, but Idaho. And he makes it all the way to the silver screen in Hollywood. So I'm like, okay. And he keeps saying, you know, they don't give any other roles to Asian Americans at that time. I didn't want to take this role as Long Duck Dong, but this is the only way I could get on the silver screen. All right, hats off to you, Long Duck Dong, Getty Wananabe. But he comes back and does it again in 1997 in Booty Call. He plays almost the exact same role. And I say, you can't do it twice. You can't continue to do these roles. And people kept talking about the Joy Luck Club in the late 1990s still. They kept saying, oh, isn't this a, a wonderful example of Chinese Americans? Look at the film. Look at the book. It's saying, once again, all the ways in which you can assimilate to America is through whiteness. And they all end up in the arms of white women. We begin to see some changes in the Asian American in prime time. Uh, my my uh, obsession with Lucy Liu is, is unreal with Holly McBeal. Um, I will not deny that at all. But we begin to see some roles begin to change by the 1990s, and it's at this time that I'm still trying to find my way. I'm still trying to analyze all, all this, and what does this mean to my identities? And so the empowered identities finally comes along. It took this years of engagement this years of critical reflection, these years of trying to decipher what does this all mean, and I come to the conclusion I'm Korean adopted America, American, living in America and Korea. Can't I be both at the same time? I keep saying to myself, can I be Christian and a liberal at the same time? But couldn't I be both? Can I be more complex than what these ascribed and these achieved identities are trying to tell me. And when does it all begin to come together? Is my niece, who now has her own baby, she came up to me and she knew I was hurting. She knew I was aching. She said, Johnny, Uncle Johnny, it doesn't matter who you are. I love you. I love you. And the thing is, when she's saying that, I'm looking at myself and saying, I can't even love myself. Because that 14-year-old kid who used to look in the mirror and spit at his own face and saying, if he could only look more American, those girls might like you. If you could only look more American, maybe those fathers wouldn't chase you away. Because that's the way in which I kept thinking about it. But in Korea, it was the same thing. Trying to date Korean women, their fathers chased me away more than, than those American fathers. <laughs> But she loved me. There was something good about me, right? If she could love me, there's something good inside of me that I had to find out. And things began to change very quickly. In 1999, this was the first gathering of Korean adult adoptees in Washington, D.C. Now, I tell you folks, when I got off that plane in Seoul, Korea, that was an empowering moment. While just looking at it at that, but standing on the steps of, with 400 Korean adult adoptees, I can never relive this moment again in my life. But this was powerful to me. Because we sat around in rooms and conferences and we talked about our stories and our stories matched up. No longer was I alone. No longer was I the only one in the room feeling this way. And it was quite funny, or 
ironic, or the ways in which we talked about these stories was rather interesting because we were in Korea at the same time, but the adoption agencies never told us we were in Korea at the same time. We could have been in the same hotel, because they all sent us to the same hotels. And we could have been at the same kimbap shop with tears in our eyes. But that was the disempowering identities. We were so separated from one another. And it was during the third Korean gathering in Seoul where we came together again. But these were the opportunities that Dr. Eddie Moore Jr. gave me to raise this voice, to go back to Lee dong and say to him, I'm carrying out my promise to you that I will not let America treat you the way that they treated me. I will write the books, I will give the speeches, I will empower, I will, I'm sorry, I will find ways for you to empower your identity. And so I begin looking at the new films, and Lucy Liu is back in Charlie's Angels, and we see Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon at this time, and yes, Eddie Moore Jr. and I are walking through uh, uh, the, the schools of Iowa, and we're now Chris Tucker and Jackie Chan, as you can imagine. And we begin to see the, the breaking of the racial lines in Hollywood, where we begin to see Asian men playing opposite white women. And sports, uh, I've always been, I've been big into sports, and you know, as a, you know, if I was, if I was a young man in 1990, when I was a young man in 1994, I kept thinking, I wish I would have seen Park chan ho pitch for the Dodgers when I was 14 years old. Then maybe, possibly, I could have been a major league baseball. <laughs> supposed to be a joke. Um, <laughs> um, but Hollywood has changed. We begin to see this. Uh, I, I wanted to point out in uh, Time Magazine when they, they had those Asian American whiz kids, Massey Oka is the young man, a uh, young boy in blue with the backpack who becomes a uh, hero star for some of you who are heroes um, people. Uh, we begin to see the rise of Indian and and Middle Eastern Asian roles in, in the media, and we're beginning to see more and more dynamic roles uh, on primetime television as well. So what does this all begin to mean to me? How can I be this social justice advocate? How can I begin to make a difference? Well, I can begin to look at the ways in which why the model minority is not a good, mind, uh, a good stereotype. I can begin to talk about the rise of the Asian American population and, and our role within the civil rights movements. I can begin to, to see ourselves embedded within the fabric of America, fighting for these social justice uh, issues as well. And I can begin to continue to say that we should be pro-affirmative action and not anti-affirmative action. But part of me still says nothing really changes. William Hung on uh, one of those shows, um, American Idol, um, we see David Carradine still on doing commercials for the yellowbook.com, and yes, Tom Cruise gets to be the last samurai, folks. That's, that's quite amazing to me. But uh, we, we still see the same happening with Rosie O'Donnell to Rush Limbaugh to, to Shaquille O'Neal, and yes, Lynn Sanity uh, came out with a chink in the armor. And the Tiger Moms uh, was, was quite interesting as well. But what are the new awakenings? I, I, I keep saying, when I think about those stage models, there seems to be an end. And I keep saying our identities are often always shifting and changing with context and age and different ways in which we see ourselves and in different places. And the Palmer family has grown in 2002, uh, 2000. This is a, a, a photo of us. And trying to come back together, uh, having critical dialogues with my parents rather than uh, you did this to me kind of dialogues. But my life begins to change in 2005. This is my wife, uh, 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 Korean, uh, straight out of Korea, so to say. And for the first time now, I do actually have Korean parents-in-laws, as you can see that. And bringing the two families together have been rather fascinating, to say the least. But out of this marriage comes my first son, David Mingyu Palmer. And I tell you, the day that he's born is an amazing day. And he's changed my life in so many ways. Changed the way in which I no longer think about, I should say, well, I think about 
the ways in which I want to create a better environment for him and what it means to be biracial, multiracial, bicultural, bilingual in a world that says you can only be one or the other. Mm -hmm. And then along comes my second son, Minhu, <coughs> Jonathan Minhu. And then, I mean, the, the, the thing is, I mean, it's, it's quite fascinating. Here we are trying to raise these children and both. They get to live in Korea for six, uh, so they get to live in Korea for two years and six months at a time. And, and Henry is actually born in Korea. And they, they, they speak the language and they, they know the culture, but they still continue to ask me questions. Jonathan asks me all the time, why did your parents leave you? And David keeps saying, why don't you speak Korean better? And these answers still have to become uh, part of who I am and the fabric of who I want to be. And we, as I said, we spent three year, uh, two years in, in America. Henry is actually, uh, oh, sorry. We spent two years in Korea uh, raising our family. And I mean, I still remember the first day that David comes home from kindergarten and he's in tears. And I'm ready to take some kindergarten kids out. <laughs> They're making fun of the way he talks and he doesn't speak English very well. I keep thinking to myself, maybe it's time for us to move just permanently to Korea. And it's all of these angst coming back and I don't want to put my own issues upon my son and so I try to be strong for him. I try to tell him these wonderful things of what it means to be bilingual, what it actually means to be bicultural because we have this kind of sense that, oh, isn't it a wonderful thing? But to get there, it's so difficult. And I just want to brag, we always brag about our children, I assume, but my, my son just uh, got the third place award in the whole state of New York for translation of Korean to English, English to Korean. Oh. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and trying to raise these sons in this era is quite fascinating. Trying to want, understand that they can be both American and Korean at the same time. And so we, we go back and forth to Korea, as I said, uh, uh, and it, it's going to be a, a whole new journey as a parent. But I wanted to show you uh, the Palmer family in 2014. It's just multi-ethnic, multi-racial, as you can possibly imagine uh, from all the backgrounds that we have. Uh, th these are all the cousins or my nephews, so to say. And it's, uh, it's, a, pr it's a proud Palmer family, uh, thinking about that. So I want to wrap up with these conclusions again, thinking about, you know, the Beatles and love is all you need, but it's about these lullabies, right? It's about the ways in which our identities are completely disempowered, the ways in which society wants to disempower them, the ways in which they want you to walk in these straight lines and tell you how to believe and how to act, to those awakenings. And most of the time, if we continue to call the awakenings crisis, then I think we lose. But if we call them the awakenings, that they have to be engaged, they have to be explored, they have to become our own stories, the autoethnographies that I keep thinking about. The explorations are not fun, folks. They're difficult. There's wrong turns and there's wrong people at all paths of life, but along the way you meet amazing, amazing people. And we have to continue to reflect upon these. We have to allow our children to reflect upon them, to, to tell us the angst, and not try to make the angst go away. And that leads to the empowered identities. I am a Korean adopted American, but I am David, Jonathan, and Henry's father. I am a Colgate professor. I am who I am. That leads to what I believe the long-lasting social justice advocate. The advocate that will continue to fight for what is right because we have engaged what we believe is right. We have not been told by somebody else to think or act or believe. Thank you. There are microphones uh, for questions. Uh, I'm more than happy to answer questions uh, uh, for the next 15 to 20 minutes. 
Uh, having myself uh, survived growing up in upstate New York, do you think it would be easier for you to do what you want to do with your children if you were not up there? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we live in upstate New York, uh, the beautiful Shenango Valley. Uh, you know, I, I, was, I was saying, um, when I met my wife after I already worked at Colgate, and uh, I met her in, in Seoul, Korea. She still continues to, to believe that I told her I live in New York, as in New York City. And I said, no, 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 I, I told you very clearly, and I showed you actual pictures of Hamilton, New York. Uh, so she shows up to Hamilton, New York. Uh, we get married on January 8th, and she shows up in Hamilton, New York on January 12th. And she looks at me and says, we're moving. <laughs> um, with that being said, um, and joking aside, it is difficult, uh, no matter what. It is, I think it's difficult to raise your kids in the city to raising your kids in rural upstate New York. But we've been able, we've been fortunate. Uh, we belong to a, a wonderful, uh, dynamic um, Korean, uh, Korean church, which, um, you know, my wife has become quite active, uh, active within that community. I've become active, I should say, the family has become quite active in that community. So we, be, we, we are able to find ways to navigate this. Um, and trust me, uh, the school board hears from me on a, on a monthly basis. I'm there constantly talking to them about, uh, if you're from New York, the, dig the Dignity for All Student Act and how they're going to enforce this and how they're going to regulate that. Um, but at the same time, you know, I don't want to be the helicopter parent for my kids, always having to, to put out all their flames for them. And I think that's what I was getting at here. I don't want to ascribe an identity upon them that they have to be social justice activists like their father, right? I want them to be who they want to be, but I will be there for them to talk these things through, to reflect upon the way they are. I mean, we love upstate New York. Uh, the beauty of the of the, I mean, the, I'm from I'm from Iowa. I mean, there's like one tree in Iowa. Right? <laughs> there's so many beautiful trees. We love hiking. We found you know so many things that we we go camping th throughout the state of New York all summer long. We just love that environment. And the sad, but the sad thing coming back is my mother-in-law, who uh, you know she she will she just does not like. America. Uh, she does not, I mean, I, I actually asked her at times, would you come and live with us if we lived closer to a city? And she's basically said no, uh, flat out. So I, I think that's, that weighs heavily upon uh, my wife when it comes to that question. But yeah, it's, it's not easy raising, but I think, again, what I'm trying to get at is, I think it's not easy to raise bicultural, bilingual, biracial family in the, in the era that we're in. And that's why I, I, I really appreciated Barack Obama's dreams for my father, because he really talks about that angst, that push and the pull of trying to be both and one at the same time. So thank you for your question. Anybody? Yes? Yeah, go to the, yeah. I just want to, I just want to know your interaction with, uh, you know, all the Korean kids, uh, you know, like uh, not from adoptive families, what were, you know, the interactions, uh, you know, between you and them? I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't... I said the, the, the Asian American from Korean descent who went at your school, the kids with, what was the interaction with them? Not the adoptees, you know, like uh, living with uh, their own families. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, no, I get it. From, not from an adoptive perspective, but from an Asian American perspective. I see a lot of the same things. That's what I'm saying. I think, uh, again, uh, I, 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 I study some of the history of Asian Americans, and that's why I was saying that the model minority comes out of that aspect of, you know, uh, the fistful of dollars and the backpack full of uh, education leads to quote unquote success in America. When I talk about the issues of the model minority, what do we consider success in America? having a PhD in chemistry, but coming to America and opening a small shop in, uh, in Compton, uh, uh, Compton, California. Is that considered success, right? And, and I think those are some of the issues that we're going through. The immigrant, just the immigrant issues within that alone are, are issues that are, a lot of our families are still facing to this day that, you know, their families have surrendered 
their lives, so to say, in Korea or in, in, in China now, and they're seeing more and more immigrants from there, so that the children have to, you know, succeed because their parents gave up everything for this. And, and I think the pressures that are there for these immigrant families and these immigrant children have to be addressed within that ascribed and that achieved identities as well. There's not much choice in, in many ways for these uh, young people. And so, again, but at the same time, I still remember talking with a lot of parents, uh, the Asian American, Korean American parents, and one of the messages that I, I keep trying to, trying to get parent, these immigrant parents to understand, the moment you decided at that kitchen table in Korea that you're going to immigrate to America, you have decided that you are no longer Korean. Right? I mean, in, no, in all the sense of the matter of you have changed the identity of your family at that moment that you decided to pick up and leave. Because even if, uh, again, with, with my own children thinking about it this way, no matter how much Korean I put into them, when they go to Korea, they're not seen as Korean, right? No matter how much they can assimilate into the, into the culture, assimilate into the ways of life, they're not seen or they are not recognized, their achieved identities are not recognized as Korean. And that's what I was trying to get a lot of those immigrant parents to begin to understand. But at the same time, you know, I think part of the engagement with the parents and these families is to see their role within the social justice activist mentality. That all of this does matter. All of this does have meaning within our lives. And that, that, that they need to engage it from their own perspectives as well. Going back to the, the model of engage, empower, and act. I think part of the, the immigrant story, and again, I'm, I'm blanketing. I know, I know, I'm, I'm creating this huge art. But part of the immigrant um, story is that we're allowing ourselves to accept racism because we made the choice to come to America, right? We made this choice. And so therefore, we knew that we were going to be discriminated against. We knew that we were going to be facing some of these perils. But in order for our family to gain access to this American dream, we are allowing ourselves to accept it. And I think that's part of the story back to the Asian, Asian American uh, uh, families that I'm trying, uh, again, trying to get um, uh, some, some understanding. Thank you. Thank you for so openly sharing your story. Thank you. I accept it without judgment. Um, I want to know what's going to happen when your kids come to you, because they will, when they've been teased. And what will you say to them? Yeah, no, they've already, they've already come. David, David has already come. Uh, Jonathan has come as well. And we, you know, again, in the, in the aftermath of um, this election, uh, we live in a very red part of New York, even though New York heavily favored uh, the blue candidate, so to say. We live in a very uh, much uh, red aspect of the state. And so those conversations are, are quite real. Part of it is, again, I'm, again I, I, if I come out swinging, right, I don't think that's the message I want, to, I want my, my, my boys to know. Um, but at the same time, talking to them about why people think this way. You know, what, what, you know, part of the, the idea that I have around engage, empowered, and enact, I believe a lot of, I shouldn't say a lot, the portion of the Trump supporters, I, gosh, I was trying not to say his name all the time. <laughs> the portion of the red supporters that are waving the Confederate flags and, and, and spewing aspects of hate, I see them in this identity perspective as well. That for so long they have been told your identities as white people are this. And you can't, I mean, part of the, the silencing of these identities is saying you can't say what you want to say. Part of uh, the political correct movement that I talk about in other speeches is this idea that we wanted people to understand that words could be hateful, but the PC police came along and shut down conversations altogether. And I wanted to open up these conversations. I wanted to have these conversations said so that people don't come to my office 
at Colgate University, some of, the, some of your students out there are coming to my office and having these dialogues with me. And one of the, my favorite dialogues is always, you know, the, it's usually a white, upper class, white woman coming to my office, all excited to talk about issues of race in America. And, and finally having this opportunity to have an open and honest and, and, and engaging conversation around these issues in an academic setting, and she'll come in and she'll, she'll be all excited, but then the, the office becomes quite quiet. And she'll lean in and she'll say, but Professor, I have one, one question for you. What's that question? Do I say African American or black? <laughs> and I look back at her and say, why are we whispering? <laughs> Part of what I'm trying to get at, even with my sons, is to have these conversations, to begin to understand where this hate is coming from. And this hate isn't directed at you. This hate is part of this, this fabric to, to divide. And one of the things that, you know, you're starting to see some of these things in social media, and I try not to watch it, but it catches your eye, and there's another person yelling at somebody at Michael's, and another person yelling at somebody over there, and another person yelling at somebody over there. And in all these videos, I keep thinking, where are the bystanders at? Are the bystanders so disempowered that they don't know how to stand up? And that's the message that I say to my son. Yes, son, you were, you were teased today. But do you ever see another kid being teased? And if you do, stand up. All you got to do is stand up. And I want to instill that sense of empowerment in my sons to stand up and not let hate. And one of the things that I will say, I will not allow them to fight hate with hate. Because I still remember my junior high school principal when that, that big football player who's been bailing hay since he was three years old, and I'm just this little tiny guy weighing less than 100 pounds, and he would greet me at the door every morning and say, welcome to our school. And I got so tired of it, and I jumped up and I broke his nose. <laughs> nice. And I got called into the principal's <laughs> office, and I was thinking, maybe the principal's going to be proud of me for standing up for myself not allowing this big football player to, to tease me anymore. And he basically said the same thing. Fists are fists and words are words. And in this school, we punish fists. So I called him with M, F, and something else along the lines. And then I got three more days of school suspension. But it comes back to what I was thinking about when I watched some of those social medias. Stand up with love. Don't confront the discriminator. Confront the one who's being discriminated against. Embrace that person. Ask, what is your name? Did you see a good movie today? And part of my Christian identity wants to ask that person, do you want to recite the Lord's Prayer with me? Because I want to fight hate with love, folks. That's what I want to do. Because we have enough of yelling back and forth. We have enough people hating because part of it is, part of what I believe that hate comes from is we don't know our empowered identities. What I say to my students very quickly on these issues of protest and all these things, and I support the protests. I'm not trying to say that I don't support them. But it's easy to hate. And if anger is your only emotion, we've lost. That's the disempowered identity. That's what the White Privilege Conference is for. This is what the People of Color Conference is for. To empower our identities. To come to one another and say, I love you for who you are. But you have to love yourself as who you are. And that takes a long lasting exploration in many ways. So coming back to your question, I want them to love themselves. That these people might pull at their eyes. And you can't understand why they're pulling at their eyes. Can't understand why these, these boys won't let him play. And it hurt. And I wanted to scream and I wanted to yell, but part of me had to say, son, fight, fight hate with love. And find a way to love yourself. And getting third place is, was a, a wonderful thing, you know, showing uh, some of the, and he got a hundred dollars for it. Go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, 
uh, for your candid talk. And uh, my question is related to the last one, because um, it's about uh, what your advice would be to parents who are raising uh, cross-cultural adopted children. Because uh, obviously it seems from your story that it would have been good for them to maybe teach you some Korean, so that when you first went to Korea, you, you weren't like, you know, a baby in the woods in, in that language. And so, you know, what advice would you give to, to your parents, basically, if you could go back in time? Uh, thank you. No, it, it's, uh, you know, one of, again, I, 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 I love my parents and we have a, a, a wonderful relationship still to this day. Uh, what I was trying to get at, when, when my parents adopted me, they, they often tell the story that the adoption agencies actually told them to feed us um, sauerkraut because it was the closest thing to fermented kimchi, right? If you know what kimchi is, it's fermented cabbage with red pepper paste basically within it. That was, I mean, that was just terrible advice. I mean, I think more and more of the adoptive parents of today are, are, are much more well informed. But at the same time, what, I, what, what I, I, I often see that maybe they're taking it now a little bit too far, right? I mean, I often, uh, and I, 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 I have seen, uh, I have seen what we would call somewhat cultural col colonization, right? That, that the family has now uh, actually almost tried to colonize a Korean identity, even though they're white, right? And so part of it is trying to find that balance within them, within the family, and also having the conversations with the kids, right? I mean, having the conversations with the kids to find out what, what is it that they want, right? What is it that they need? from the family in these, in these instances. But again, part of my, my first response is, hey, do your own autoethnography. Begin to search, seek out your own autoethnography within this, and who are you in this racial, uh, complex uh, society that we live in? So thank you. Question back there. Hi, um, so first I just really wanted to thank you. Um, your talk really spoke to me on a personal level. Um, my father is Korean and my mom is white, yes. and so I identify as Asian American, Hapa, multiracial, um, and I just, many of those steps when you talk about the lullaby and wanting to be white, right with you there, experience that, um, actually going to Korea, um, and then feeling uh, still not Korean, also experienced that. So I just appreciated sort of how I was able to take my multiracial identity and still sort of use your framework and relate so much. Um, and so my question though, as a middle school teacher um, at a school with a growing number of Asian American students who are part white, so uh, multiracial Asian Americans, I'm sort of wondering if uh, you would have advice about how to help facilitate their healthy uh, identity growth and if there might be some overlap um, between the ways in which we discuss identity with transracial adoptees versus multiracial students. Yeah. No, thank you. I, again, I don't think this model is just for transracial adoptees. I, I appreciate the question framed that way because I, I see all of our identities framed within this. The University of Hawaii didn't see it that way. Uh, they, they made me change many of the stage models that I have before you here today. They didn't like lullabies, let's just put it that way. They didn't like the idea that I was saying that our, our, the lullabies is this act of when we try to wake up, you know, society wants us to go, you know, just walk in line, you know, things are gonna, bad things are gonna happen, bad, you know, bad things happen to good people, and just go back to sleep around these things because, you know, you don't want to step out of this line because somebody, you, you know, something bad could happen from that. And that's the lullaby around these identities. But the, but the other scary part, especially, again, you're a middle school teacher, I don't have to tell you this thing, there's so many things going on. I mean, there's, I just talked about a racial and ethnic identity kind of going on here, but there's gender identity. Part of, I, I see this model with sexual identity as well. The lullaby is, no, 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 you're not gay. <laughs> go back to sleep, you're straight. Continue to go back into the closet. The lullabies are there, the awakenings are, are happening all around us. So again, I think you're in a better position to a certain extent, but again, going back to Barack Obama's dreams from my father, he really gets into that aspect of the biracial, multiracial identity within America. Um, but again, I think this model, 
fits for almost everybody in, in the United States. Yeah. Even the immigrant uh, identity around that as well. Last question, I know people are probably getting hungry for lunch. Yes. Well, I'm a fellow cat as well. Um, I was adopted 30 to five years ago, and I did pretty much the same journey as you did. Grew up with a family that was white, um, and two older brothers. And I now have a son who's seven and a half who asked me the same questions of where my parents are and why they left me. Um, and a, as an educator um, in middle school as well, you know, we always have those questions uh, from kids, but how, what would you say um, to help us out? What could we do? You know, I mean, I'm part of a lot of different groups on Facebook, um, but uh, I don't outwardly tell people I'm adopted. You know, when people, when people ask me what I identify with, I'm more French than American, um, because that's what my mom is. So how, without necessarily divulging our entire life story in 45 minutes to our students, how can we help them you know, grow, especially in middle school, um, with their identities? Well, part of, uh, part of the structure that you see here today is, is having those conversations around how our identities are disempowered to begin with. You know, part of uh, what, I, what I try to do with the students at Colgate as well is to try to show uh, what Lisa Delpit calls the culture of power, right? To try to show the ways in which the, these things are working against us so that now we can begin to know what we're up against. Most of the time, we don't even know what we're up against, right? I mean, uh, the, 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 the ideas around identity work or the autoethnography work is to begin to disengage from this disempowered identity and to re-engage from a new sense of understanding of who we are and how we want to be. What I say at the beginning of this talk, this is my journey. I'm not asking all Korean adoptees to say, hey, this is the road to empowerment for all, for all uh, adoptees that you have to go back to Korea, you have to marry a Korean, you have to do, that's not what I'm saying at all. Those are the decisions that I've made, but what I am trying to say is engage in them. Because most oftentimes they say, just disengage. I've had adoptive parents come up and say, I don't want my child going back to Korea because I'm afraid they're going to leave me like you almost did with your own parents. Right? That's the disengaged identity. That's the disempowered identity where people are telling us, we don't want you to engage in it. I want people to engage in these stories. I want, again, what we've heard this morning, engaging in the story of genocide in America. Rather than glossing over this period, we have, we have slaves, we have Lincoln freeing the slaves, we have this long history, oh, civil rights. And everything in between is, is disengaged from us. That's what I would like our students from middle school to elementary school to high school to college to begin engaging these stories in their stories. One of the things that I learned very quickly at an elite institution like Colgate University, some of the rhetoric that I come along with is rhetoric that goes against what their, my students, their grandparents have told them. So when I go against what their grandparents are telling them, they're looking at me like I'm the evil, I'm the evil educator. But if I ask them to go back and engage their grandparents, not just change their grandparents, because I think that's where we get in, in a lot of trouble. Oh, go home for Thanksgiving and have these race dialogues, <laughs> right? No, to engage them, to ask their parents, their grandparents, why do you think this way? Where did your education come from? And rather than the disengagement, again, comes back to all of this, is that we silence those dialogues, and we don't even know where those dialogues are coming from. I mean, my grandmother is... Um, is of German descent, and she would say terrible things. I mean, just horrible things about my wife. And it hurt me deeply. But it, rather than getting angry at my grandmother, I would ask her, why do you think that way? She got married the day before Pearl Harbor. She got married the day before Pearl Harbor. She's driving down from, from da uh, Davenport, Iowa, to New Orleans for a honeymoon. That was the story she began to tell me. 
then it starts to ring a bell, right? Then I can start making a connection with my grandmother who's saying these awful things about Asian women. I can begin to make a connection with her rather than disengage from her. Oh, Grandma, you're racist. Oh, Grandma, come into the 21st century. So old and thinking this way. My grandma's gonna just, <laughs> I'm not talking to you about those things. So engage around these issues rather than disengage. But it doesn't have to be finger pointing. It doesn't have to be shameful. It doesn't have to be bashing. Does it have to be critical? Yes. Do I have to bend over backwards and say, yeah, you get to do whatever you want to me? No. But the empowered identities lead to those conversations, that my grandma could say those things about my wife, and I could begin to say to myself, then where is she coming from? Why is she making these statements? Thank you, everybody. I hope you have a great conference. Thank you, Atlanta.